Hello, I'm Jeff Johnston, host of the Living Undeterred podcast, and today I welcome my good friends Marquise Copper and Ramir McRae from the wonderful part of the United States, New Jersey, which I have been there one time. Actually, my uh, my middle son had a golf tournament there at one of your beautiful courses. I don't remember the name of the course, but I do remember uh, New Jersey was a, a hustling and bustling place, a lot different than Cedar Rapids, Iowa, but Welcome to the show, guys. Uh, we've talked a number of times. This is the first time you guys have been on my podcast. I was uh, honored to be a guest on your podcast. But again, welcome to the Living on a Turd podcast. Thank you for having us, Jeff. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to have a great, great conversation. Uh, I know the last few times I've talked with you guys, and when I was a guest on your show, it seemed like we could have just went on and went on and went on. Every time we opened up one door, we went down another and we all shared some intimate, personal challenges that we've had. Uh, all three of us have had mental health issues and things like that, that I think it'd be, it'd be fair game to throw that on the table today because part of what helps people navigate through mental, mental health challenges is two things, connection and vulnerability. And I think you both excel at that because it didn't take us long when we first talked for you guys to really open up. So. Why don't, uh, first question I have for you guys, how'd you come up with the name of your podcast? Oh, Marquise. Oh, Marquise. <laughs> I know you like to talk about this. The huh? love, the love Sparrow yeah. podcast. I love it. Yeah. I knew that was coming. Cause, uh, um, so love Sparrow, uh, originally came from this idea that love should have an infinite number. So really, if I break it down, it really comes from scripture, uh, talking about, um, just the amount of just sparrows in general mm -hmm. and how not one falls without God knowing. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a numerous amount and they're all fed on a daily basis. And then uh, going to another scripture talking about how if he can take care of those sparrows, don't you think he can take care of you? Mm -hmm. So really that comfort and that um, numerous amount of love that you can spread to your loved ones, to people you don't know, it should just be a constant thing. There shouldn't be a moment where love isn't the focal point of what you do as a human being. So that's really where that that title came from. And really just thinking of Love Sparrow in general was just a for me, it was like a quick title. It was titled like, hey, I like that. Mm -hmm. I can run with that. That's something that I can stick by. And just the the benefit behind it is just the overall. It's an overall message that helps me realize that there is not a minute that goes by where I shouldn't show love to somebody in some way, shape or form, whether it be a smile, whether it be an interaction, whether it be a conversation or whether just saying. Hey, how's it going? How you doing? How's your day going? Something like that is, it may seem simple and rudimentary, but you know what? It, it, it's effective. It's Definitely. effective. It just means to spread love. Spread love all over. Be love. Yes. Don't don't discriminate towards who, whoever you come across. Uh, every story is unique. Everybody's unique. And everybody is just looking for that love. So that's what we like to embody with the title. It's interesting, Ramir, when you said the word discriminate, I, I kept thinking about that drugs and alcohol and substance abuse doesn't discriminate. Yeah. And, you know, I, I just immediately my mind went to thinking of my definition for that word, because if you think about mental illness, it doesn't discriminate. None um, of it. If you think about alcoholism, it doesn't discriminate. If you think about drug use, it doesn't discriminate addiction. And so you're exactly right. Um exactly right that I think one of the one of the issues that we're trying and I say we as in us three uh trying to move the needle in the mental health space is have these conversations about who's affected by mental illness and there's so much stigma you know that we just think that it's the the down and out people or the people that are struggling financially or but the reality is a lot of very successful people athletes, actors, musicians that you wouldn't think have any reason to be struggling. They're the ones that you get up the next morning and see that took their own life. You're so surprised. They're the one that overdosed on fentanyl. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really an eye opening experience when you guys, when you see that type of stuff. Like Robert Williams that, that uh, unfortunately took his life. He was like, what? I thought he was happy. Mm -hmm. I thought he, he had everything he wanted. Lo and behold, you never know it. And that's what this, that's what we come in. You got to break that right. wall down somehow. So how did you guys, if you guys want to take this one at a time, what's your story in regards to 
getting into mental health advocacy. And, you know, your podcast is geared very much towards helping people get through that tough moment or get to the next day. But what are your individual stories? How do, how do you guys end up uh, here today on, on the Living Undeterred podcast? Uh, if you don't mind, Marquise, I'll go. I, I, I'll take this one. Um, for me, <laughs> it, it all started uh, when I was diagnosed with uh, ADHD and I was put on all different types of medicine, all different types of things uh, growing up. I mean, Caserta, Ritalin, all that just to calm me down. And I, I never thought of myself as an over hyped kid. I was an adopted kid. I found out I was uh, I was uh, adopted at five months. Well, not adopted, but I was uh, given up at five months uh, by my mother, hmm. then uh, adopted at the age of five and told at a very early age that I was adopted. And I could never, you know, wrap my head around it. I'm a five-year-old. <laughs> I, I, can't, yeah. I can't wrap my head around what adoption was. I remember, I remember the conversation they had. They said, you're adopted. I was like, I don't know what that means. So can I have the lollipop, please? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they passed exactly. me the lollipop. I don't really know what you're talking about. But did you struggle with that growing up? I struggled a lot growing up. I, matter of fact, I remember crying profusely almost every day, thinking nobody loved me because I just couldn't think that why 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 me? Like I didn't do nothing. I'm five months. I, I didn't do nothing. Right. Why would you just give me up like that? And then here I am into a different family where I'm I unfortunately didn't feel as welcomed into this this mm-hmm. whole family because you already have a family over here a whole structure over here that I'm I'm not familiar mm-hmm. with nor am I really a part quote unquote a part of and then mm-hmm. growing up it, it, with the riddling and stuff I, I never wanted to be on the medicine I, I've seen the effect that it had and took on me and I always would ask can I get off this medicine and get off this medicine and the doc you know you go into doctors and they want to keep you in because they're getting money Every time yeah. they see you. So she would never take me off until I was 18. And I had to, uh, I had to right to take myself off. <laughs> and I took myself right. off and I seen what it was doing to me. It was curving. What, my... that, what happened when he, what happened when you got off it? I have to ask. I, at first it went through like a, like a, like a withdrawal of, you know, I felt sluggish. I felt like I'm not me. You know, this is not me. I'm not me. Right. But after a while I felt my energy, like just, increasing. I felt myself mm-hmm. coming back to me, I want to say in that uh, mm-hmm. form, because when you're on Ritalin, your body just knows to stop. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. know anything else or concerta. Your body just stops. You're still going. Your mind's still going. But your body's like, no more. <laughs> Sit down. Well, I have to jump in because in my book, I talk about in 1990, mm-hmm. There were 600,000 prescription stimulants given to 600,000 kids yeah. within a decade. So from actually two decades, I'm sorry, from 1990, it was 600,000 kids on prescription stimulants like Ritalin, Stratera, yeah. and now it's Adderall. Uh, within 20 years, listen to this, guys. It went from 600,000 to 3.5 million yeah, yeah. kids. Now, you tell me that kids are any different over two decades? No, but the diagnosis was different. Of course. You know, and I, I'm not indicting the medical profession, but you guys know when I was on your show, my son's journey started with Adderall. Yeah, so, that's where... Ramir, I can certainly, and he got on at 16. You were getting off Ritalin at 18. Yeah. Um, and it, it took so, a toll. So, after that, I mean, did, did you then the natural thing would be maybe replace that with something else. Did you get into other things to replace that void that Ritlin had not, left when you stopped? Not necessarily. Uh, I, I went into sports and stuff like that. Something more positive that to take my energy and place it somewhere mm-hmm. other than uh, use, using like drugs and stuff like that. How, however, I mean, life still happened <laughs> from, mm-hmm. from that point yeah. on uh, 18 I remember I was 18, then I met my real mother at the age of 20 Oh through, wow. through Facebook. And that, Did you seek her out or did she seek you I out? Wasn't, I, at, at, for the longest period of time, I was seeking her out, uh, me and my okay. sister. And then one day, I'm just on Facebook late at night. Well, I wasn't even on Facebook. I just hear the notification go off on my phone. I'm like, and it just says, I am your mother. And I'm like, who is this lady? <laughs> and I'm like, what? 
Holy cow. And I'm like, okay, I don't I don't believe this. Uh this is like spam. <laughs> and then my yeah. and then my uh sister had called me and told me like I well I called my sister and she told me, Yeah, that's your mom. That this is this is her. And I'm like So what feelings, what emotions did you have? I was overjoyed. I was very overjoyed, but that that was cut short after a while because I I, I like uh I used to go to church. And mm-hmm. I was big in in the church, so I had invited my mom to come out to church for me to meet me, so I was in a safe place when I was meeting sure. her and everything. And then she said she was coming, it did nothing. No response oh, wow. to date. She was supposed to show up and nothing. I was it just felt like I was abandoned all over again. And this is all again, uh, yeah. this is all while I'm in high school. <laughs> so this is when I'm Wow meeting Marquise and and going through, you know, high school struggles and all yeah, that. I mean, you got enough stuff going on being an adolescent in, in high school. Exactly. So then, I mean, she did that about twice, and then I was over it. I'm like, I'm grown now. I don't really need you. And then my sister had uh, inboxed me. My my little sister, she was 11 at the time, and she just was so cute how she inboxed me, and she really wanted her older brother. So that, that made me want to go out there and seek. And I did, mm-hmm. and I did that. It was a good relationship for a little bit, but you can't. Yeah, I mean, it went south real quick. And then on that note, I had lost my grandmother around this time, and my grandmother yeah. in this family that I'm in was my glue, my everything. She was my lady. She taught me everything. I she taught me how to cook. She taught me how to talk. She was the life of the party. She's the reason my I'm the way I am right now. But sure. When I lost her, I mean, I didn't know how to deal with that. And then I met my real grandmother three months later, I want to say, and then she died. <laughs> I mean, oh, man. I mean, she died like the next month after I met her. And then I was like, what? <laughs> what is going on? What is? It seems like you got abandonment. You got loss. You got grief. Oh, you know, maybe some guilt. Oh, yeah. You know, all those emotions are like weighing on you. And then you're going through the normal stresses of uh, thinking about high school what are you doing after high school that. girlfriends but you know it's like definitely have it weighs heavy and that's when i got into the alcohol and the yeah. alcohol side of things where I, I i used to never drink before that because before i met my mother that's that was the reason why she had to give us up so i was like i would never drink i would never do sure. drugs i'm not doing none of that because this i don't want to be her and then after I met her, I was like, "Man, I'm a t- I, I, let, let me see what this is about." And then ever since then, I've been I mean I've been drinking, and drinking and drinking, mm-hmm. and, and I found myself drinking myself into a slump when I was going through. Mm-hmm. And one of my one of my closest friends had had told me he was like, "Listen, I understand you know a drink here or there for social reasons is good, but never do it when you're going through something because then it becomes a uh, uh, addiction habit. Then you you look right. for it when you start to go through things, right? And as as much as people tell you things, you, you know, young young you don't want to listen until until older you kicks in and say, "Hey, he was right." <laughs> it's called it's called wisdom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I, and I still wonder if I have it anymore. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, but so so you had some struggles with alcohol. Did did you then make a decision to quit? Uh, not necessarily. I'm still I'm still going through. I mean, quitting wise, like totally cold, cold turkey. Yeah. No, I'm not gonna even yeah. sit up here and say no. Uh, yes, but right. I, I mean, and a lot of people can manage it. But that 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 perspective wise of using it as a a, a stimulant and using it as a, a get over method. Yeah, I found myself, you know, I, I sometimes someday I don't need it. I'm good, but sometimes, depending on the 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 struggle, it it, it creeps back up into the mindset of, hey, just had this bottle. You know, you're going through had this bottle, but then I have people like Marquise, or that I call, or uh, my my friend Deshaun. He was a part of this podcast. He will be coming back. I uh, well, part of our podcast, and he will be coming back. But those are the people I, I turn to. And it's so important, which brings me to how we became a podcast and how we became a thing. Because in high school, even though I was going through all my struggles, like I just mentioned, Marquis, I had met Marquise 
and he was going through his own personal struggles and we were two of the opposite <laughs> spectrums. We, <laughs> I was considered outgoing, very vocal. And I didn't like him. <laughs> and I, and Mar- hey, we're gonna we're gonna get to you, Marquise. You gotta stay in the green room. Stay in the green room, Marquise. This is my story. I'm not done with right, I'm not done with right from here yet. No, uh, so when I met Marquise, he was more of the. To me, it was like I know everything. I I I, I, I I'm going through it, but I'm strong, so I'm not gonna show it. I'm, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do it. And uh, it was like I don't like you, Marquise. I don't like I don't like who you are. You're, <laughs> you're too strong minded, and I'm too strong minded, and we would just collide all the time, and all of viewpoints would collide, and we were going through a lot of the similar same things. However, sure. we never sat down and talked at all. We were young. We were just we were we were young, and we just wanted we just I don't understand you. You don't understand me. Let's not understand each other. Sure. <laughs> Until we got older, and then we started actually talking things out. And I'm like, "Hey, man, mm-hmm. you went through this. I went through that. Or you've been there. Mm-hmm. How did you get down this road and end up where I'm at? Even though you went down a whole different road." You lived a whole different lifestyle. I didn't live your lifestyle. Right. And at first, when we came into doing the podcast, I mean, Marquise came to me with this idea, and and I was like, I'm all for it. Let's go. Let's do this. I mean, we have different viewpoints, so we can hit different topics. And when we're talking about different topics, we can give these people different viewpoints of how, because everybody's not the same, of right. how to uh, either deal with the issue or go through the issue or however you take the information, but we can give some people this help. My way helps some other people, your way helps other people. And then we started realizing, man, we are a lot of the same. We have a lot of the same mindset. <laughs> like we think a lot alike. Uh, we learned each other a lot more. And then, which made me want to learn more about the mental health aspect. Cause Marquise was already in it and I was learning yeah. about it a lot. And now I'm where I'm at where I'm at now today, where I'm more understanding of like his 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 story. I would say because he's going to tell his story in a minute, but uh, I'm I'm more understanding of his story. At first, I wasn't. At first, I was like, "Man, get through it or get over it." We all have to get over it, but now I'm like, "Yeah, let's get through it. Let's 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 go. Let's think of ways to go throw it together. Like let's. <laughs> it's a whole different. Well, what you just what you're validating, Ramir, is the the fact that like everybody's road to the mental health is space is paved with a personal story. And my quote that we have on the back of our t-shirts and it's all over our tour is purpose becomes passion when it gets personal. So it's like Mm -hmm. you, until something happens to you personally, like I had no at 50, what 50 years old, I'm 56 now. So at 50, I, I mental health to me, you know, <laughs> what was it? I was an investment guy. I, I was coaching, I was watching football and basketball. I was, you know, going out for dinner, drinking wine, just kind of living my life. And then my son dies. All of a sudden now I get this spark of passion. Like, okay, maybe I got to start thinking about addiction and substance abuse. And then when my wife died, that just let the floodgates down. I'm like, now I'm all in. I'm, I'm all in. So yeah, purpose becomes passion when it gets personal. Okay. Marquise, you are up. The floor is yours. Oh, he's for this. Oh, <laughs> but it's in that Lizzo song. It's about time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, uh, you know, I, I, I like to, I guess start with, I guess, my youth, because that's where everything kind of started um, at a very early age. And recently I've revealed some of this stuff that I didn't really share before. But at an early age, I was physically abused. I was mm-hmm. molested. I was beat up frequently. Like I, right now, I'm over six feet. I wasn't back then as a little kid. I was not that tall. I was nowhere near that tall. And I'm built like a football player. So I wasn't like that at all as a little kid. So you think of me now, like Ramir thinks of me all the time. And he says, you know, you're so big, man. Nobody beat you up. Nobody bullied you up, man. I got bullied beyond belief. It's like I Terry Crews. Maybe that made you become big then. Maybe you got into weight and all that because of that. It's like Terry Crews, No, it was man. anxiety. I ate too much. Uh, by the way, anxiety. I love Terry Crews. <laughs> I caught him on a couple of podcasts and he's the man. Oh, my goodness, man. Yeah, he is cool. But, uh, yeah, so... 
Uh, yeah, so as a young kid, you know, average height for the average boy, you know, and at six years old, being physically abused and again, uh, being molested at five, being molested again at like eight, um, being molested again at like 11, hmm. you know, these these things. And mind you, I recently started talking about that. I didn't before until we had that episode a little while ago talking about men get molested, too. And then we all kind of opened up and hmm. I, I never admitted that ever. Um, but Can I had I stop to- you for a second. I mean, is that that's something you had to carry with you all these years? And then when you when you unloaded that to the world, mm-hmm. was that a huge sense of liberation and relief to you? I mean, if for anything, it was a realization because, you know, when you think about it as a little kid, you're like, what just happened? I don't know. This feels so weird. Right. But as a grown man, you're like, hey, that really happened to me. Hmm. That really happened. This explains a lot. And not, and not to cut you off, but even when we did that episode, when we were going through it, when, when each of us were explaining our story, it like opened up the door of memories that you had suppressed in the back of your So mind. you guys did this live on a show? Yes. Is that is that something people can actually find in your archives and watch? Yes. Yep. Really? Oh, yeah. Man, I, I need to go back and watch that, Marquise. I really do. I, I think that would be quite a experience for me to see you guys actually discuss this in real time because I have such ad- admiration and respect and of of and obviously the the women as well, but for the for the men, which I, I have met at least a dozen in this last year. You know, one one friend of mine came out in his fifties. You know, wow. He held it that long. He is but, a carry in it. I mean, I'm proud. I'm proud of you, Marquise. I really am. And for all the men out there that are waiting for an opportunity to talk, you've proven that it's possible. And for the young boys that have recently been molested that are holding this in, they need to know that it's okay to talk to somebody, a trusted person, really you know, because okay. I mean, you, you, you can become an instant role model inspiration for, for a whole generation of kids that, that are being abused. You don't understand how how much how much it weighs you down when you hold it in, and yeah. like like you said, fifty years, Marquise, you're twenty mm-hmm. something. I'm not I don't, I don't know your age. I'm twenty eight, and I was holding so much in for that episode as well. And, and matter of fact, I was holding it in, but like I said, it was suppressed. So when he started talking about it, it started flooding back into my memory, and I'm like, wait a minute, wow. It happened to me too, and I, and I just blocked it out. There were so many memories I actually blocked out from childhood that I'm like, what? <laughs> well, I, I just stand so impressed with you guys. I I really am. I mean, I think, um, I don't know. It's just very impressive to to have you guys have the the courage is the word that comes to mind. You know, yeah. to look this in the face, not just from a society's perspective. But when you look in the mirror, you know, what you see back, you know, you see, you see someone you can be proud of, you know, because a lot of kids that have this happen to them, they, they really take it as it was their fault, you know, and you're just a kid, you don't know any better. And yeah. it's, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud of you too. Um, and there's a lot of people that are going to see this and are going to reach out to me and I'll send them over to you guys because you guys can certainly, certainly help a lot of people, uh, I don't want to say get through it or get over it because I don't think you ever do, no. but, but learn to evolve it into your story. Right. That, matter of fact, yeah, I could say it better. <laughs> yeah. Get, get getting honor. over it. So getting over, it's, it's just a, we need to stop saying that. Right. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that stigma needs to be broken. Yeah. ASAP. And I yep. think we said this, we said this, uh, I guess you call this illustration about, you know, when you're experiencing trauma, you're experiencing this different things that you're suffering from. It's like a train going through a tunnel. But meanwhile, the tunnel is built into a huge rock face mountain with jagged edges. The mm-hmm. terrain is very rough. You trying to take a shortcut to go over that, you're going to get way more banged up, bruised and cut and scarred by going trying to go over something or get over something. Meanwhile, if you take that train ride through that tunnel, yeah, it's dark at first, but it will get lighter at the towards you get to the end of the tunnel. And that's the most important part. We forget about that. We want to make these quick adjustments. We want to do um, coping mechanisms. I, I usually like discourage mm-hmm. coping mechanisms. I, I always recommend mental health tips, tricks, and strategies. 
coping mechanisms work as on, only work as long as the object is available. So mm -hmm. yeah, you might choose drugs this one day. Okay, what happens that drug is no longer available? Okay, now right. you're moving on to the next thing. Okay, now that thing is no now longer you find available. Yourself oh, you deeper on to and deeper and deeper, and you find yourself deeper into that rabbit hole of. It's yeah, that I remember, it just, I remember us talking about leaning into trauma, leaning into adversity, and the way you just described it with the tunnel, Marquise, is so beautiful. Um, because I think people picture things. I know I'm a visual guy. It's like I, I can relate to things if someone can picture that image in my mind. So someone could say something and with my attention deficit and Ramir, I, I have attention deficit. So you and I get together, we're going to cause a lot of problems. <laughs> we'll be looking we at everything. We ain't going to fix anything. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'm sure you as well, and you're a lot younger than me, but I'm sure you lean into your attention deficit as kind of a superpower. You tap into oh, it. You know? That's how it became um, this creative. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, but again, I like the way you said that coping mechanisms, Marquise, I'm jumping back to each one of you guys, because you guys both are saying so many great things. Because when I think of coping mechanisms, I think of the positive coping mechanisms, you know, meditation, working out, but you were referring to the negative coping mechanisms, drinking, drugs, lying, stealing. Do you want to maybe finish that point? I kind of interrupted you on that when you were talking about coping mechanisms. I know you're good. So like, uh, I always say, I always think of mechanisms as something that distracts you or something that takes your, your, your thought or that emotion in a different direction, kind of channeling it. I kind of think of it as a, a lightning rod in the middle of a crazy rainstorm. The lightning can strike anybody at any given moment. We don't know if that ever can happen or will, if it will ever will happen. But that lightning rod directs that lightning to a specific point and uses that electricity to power something up. Whenever we look at coping mechanisms, it's kind of like us standing outside in the rain with a bucket of water and a nail stuck, like strapped to our forehead. We're almost begging for this, yeah, some sort of relief, but we're also putting ourselves in harm way in the, in the process of it. Sure. So we may look at um, something to help us cope with something. Um, I don't like coping only because coping makes me feel like I'm struggling to get to get over or get through work through something. I want something that's going to give me long-term longevity. And I, I guess longevity and long-term is the same thing. But just the emphasis on I want a structure that I can use for the rest of my wow. life. So that, that's why I always recommend mental health tips, tricks, and skills. Skills that you can learn. Things that grounding techniques. Things that will really put you in the moment and give yourself a moment to breathe. Realize where you are, who you are, because we forget sometimes. Wow. And now push yourself to the point where... You're not trying to rely on something or someone to help you get get through this hurdle, get over this hurdle. Now you have the skills to help yourself when no one's around. And I'll get when we go back into my story, I'll tell you a little bit more about where that. I came just from. want to cut you off real quick, just real quick. Cause I, I, Don't you always? I, I know, I know, I do. Uh, but as uh, far as I, the coping mechanism thing goes, there's positive coping mechanisms out there. There is positive coping mechanisms out there. And I, if that's your way of first getting your foot in the door to get to what you said, Marquise, the, the long term, the longevity of the, the, the piece you need and the, 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 the path you need to go on, then by all means, use those positive coping mechanisms to get there and boost you towards that. But if you can avoid it and get to that piece that you need, then by all means, try that. Mm -hmm. oh, and that's exactly where I would go back into my story, uh, because, again, I started off with coping mechanisms and I elevated past that because it wasn't enough. Yeah. So to, if you're fine with me going back to my story, it's up to you guys. I want you to go back to your story. I, I, I'm really I'm done. I'm really uh, intrigued by how you guys ended up where you're at. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so uh, at, in the midst of all these things, physical abuse, um, minor sexual assault, I really don't like talking about that. But I guess eventually I will open up about that. Mm -hmm. It goes more with the whole mol molestation thing. Mm -hmm. But at around the age eight, that's when I really started to develop depression. Um, and again, it was so many traumatic events. I remember that same year, there was like, let's see, about three or four funerals. It was like my aunt, my mom's, uh, my mom's uncle, so my great uncle, and one of our cousins that my mom was a little closer with. 
and between maybe three or four months just death after death after death and i was like man i'm scared to die you know as an eight-year-old you shouldn't be thinking about that at all but i was thinking of so many different thoughts and it just was compounding and that's when i first like felt that that feeling that i'm completely alone Hmm. that complete I am in a desolate wasteland that's called my mind. And I do not understand how to get myself out of it. I don't know how I find my reprieve. So it, it was getting me to the point where I would just isolate myself randomly. Or I would just randomly talk to myself. Now, as an early age, I tried coping mechanisms. I tried talking to myself. I tried um, reciting poetry in my own head because I love poetry. I love art. Um, mm-hmm. And a little later on, poetry kept helping me. Um, but you see, after... Me using those coping mechanisms, I noticed it worked until I stopped depending on them. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that the more that I wanted it, I wanted these things to happen for me. Some days I didn't want to write. I didn't want to read anything. I, I didn't want to recite anything. I didn't want to talk to myself. So those things didn't work in those moments. Mm-hmm. So then I caught myself in a period where the the hole I was in was so dark. I couldn't tell if there was someone trying to reach out to help me. I couldn't tell if there was a rope thrown down. And mind you, I'm using metaphors and illustrations, but mm-hmm. I couldn't tell if there was any help for me at all. It was like I completely blocked myself out. So at that early age, I threw up a wall. And this wall was strong because previous, previous, excuse me, exit, re- reverse that. Previous <laughs> to all these things happening, I was always smiling. I was laughing. My mom would tell you, a lot of older, 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 older people would tell you, that I was a very happy child. And that is true. Mm-hmm. I was also way too innocent and way too gullible at an early mm-hmm. age. I had to fix that later on. But I just felt like a lot of people kept trying to rob my innocence from me, kept trying to take it from me as if it didn't belong to me. Mm-hmm. They're trying to make me, make me grow up way sooner. So as time went on, this depression got deeper, deeper, and deeper. And around 14 years old, the summer of 20, 2008, just graduated eighth grade, two months in. My grandmother ends up passing away. And the problem is she passed away in front of me. Oh, wow. She was literally like just in front of me. Just she was there for half a second. We drove off and they confirmed it after we drove off that she was out. But I saw her take her last eye closed, last breath. And how, was old you, how old were you again? I was 14. Wow. I was 14. I saw her close her eyes for the last time and I was like. Wow. And in the process of it, I was listening to like three songs around that time. It was, and all three of them happened to be Maxwell songs. And I know I love Maxwell. I can't listen to those three songs to this day without crying. It's just, I it's bet. associated forever with her. No, no, so no. you go through that. Yeah. Me starting high school a month after that. And my emotions were all over the place. I didn't know how to comprehend anything. And, you know, we're thinking, to, to, you know, when we grew up in a generation where, you know, the generation before us, they, they were taught, hey, man up, you know, yeah. don't be that crying. Was my, that was my generation for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Men don't cry. Men don't show emotions. It's a weakness and you'll get, you'll get taken advantage of. If you fall down, you don't cry. You get back you know? up and you keep it moving. Yeah. Yep. And yep. the thing about it was, Such wrong. I tried that. I tried that. And now, see, that's a coping mechanism I tried too. How can I be a better man? I'm 14 years old. What I know about that? You You still a boy. (laughs) You know? (laughs) You know? And and because of that, I had this coping mechanism where, again, I'm trying to be a better man. I'm trying to do things as a man would do. And that didn't help me. It made things worse for me. It was the equivalent to me having a cut, throwing a bandaid on it, but then taking it off and throwing hot sauce on it. You know, it, it didn't, it didn't really help. Right. So what ended up happening is, uh, I think two months into my freshman year of high school, something happened where I believe a classmate was like going after me. He was really just, I wouldn't call it fully bullying, but it was kind of bullying. Um, and it, it was just, I wanted to defend myself, but the emotions of my grandma hit that exact moment. I'm like, why of all moments right now? Yeah. And I started crying and it wasn't like ball out crying. It was like a few tears. And they looked at me like, oh, look, he crying. He crying. Oh, look, a big old baby. Oh, we ain't saying nothing about you that bad, man. Why are you crying? And I couldn't even speak. I was just like, wow. I didn't know what to do at that moment. So I went to the bathroom real quick, came back. I just like, I just, you know, ate the bowl of crud and just let the day going out. But again, that stuck with me for like three years. So till junior year, that stuck with me. 
senior year was different. I grew a bunch of inches tall. I got my football body with yeah, back up. People weren't messing with me nowhere near as much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so people weren't messing with me nowhere near as much as they were before. You know, so it got a little easier. And then, you know, senior year, of course, this is when I met these guys. But prior to that, I was writing poetry like vigorously. I was writing anywhere from one to three poems a day. And I wish that was a fake number. That's a real number. I literally had 16 binders full of poems. It ain't no fake number. have them? I still have every last one of them. Every last one of them. Um, each poem are they, different. Are they, are they pretty deep poems? I mean, were you, you really get off on what was in your mind at the time? Or, or if you read them, would it be like reading a diary? If I read them now, I'm thinking to myself, who wrote this? Because oh, okay. I, don't, I don't recognize that person at all anymore. Interesting. It grew. And I, I read some stuff yeah. from I read some stuff from back then. And I'm like, I was way deeper than I am now. What happened? You know, mm-hmm. and that perspective, looking at who I was, taking the good parts and reflecting on them and pushing them forward helped me a lot in that that class that we first met in, which was creative writing class. It was creative writing slash drama. And that's what we all kind of excel because we love to laugh. We love to we act, writers. joke. <laughs> I'm here. And, that and that's when you guys first met. Yeah. Well, that's when we first interacted well, with each other. Interacted. I met Ramir freshman year by accident. I don't want to go into this story. <laughs> Can I tell you a story now real I fast? Hear, now I got to hear. He's <laughs> waving his finger story? now. I got to hear this story. I don't story want to now. see this finger. Can I, this? Can I tell this story, I please? What it is, and Ramir I mean. doesn't want it told, so now I have to hear it. <laughs> okay, I will tell a story. So my first <laughs> interaction with Ramir. <laughs> was actually a uh, freshman year. It was like maybe four months into school. And I think it was four months into school. Uh, and apparently him and another guy had some sort of beef. Oh, I don't man. know what it was, but yeah, that story. And he had some sort of beef. And I remember standing on the lunch line. I got my lunch, sat down and the table that I was sitting in was right in front of where the line was, maybe like a good 15 feet in front of the, where the line was. So another kid, apparently him and him and uh, Ramir had a struggle. And, you know, it went from a tap to a tap, a push to a push, a shove to nah. a shove, to Ramir taking his whole tray of, of food and shoving it in the guy's face. It's no way. If I could tell this story, I'd tell that story because uh, <laughs> you're going to make me look bad. Um, <laughs> it's like Diver with no, the Kid. No, I'm impressed, man. actually. What, what, what was happening there was... That I, do you ever remember why you were fighting? Uh, yes. Um, no. I actually do remember. Oh, you do? Well, what was happening? I don't remember any of the reasons why I ever had fights. <laughs> I remember some because I, I I dealt with also in my story I dealt with a lot of anger issues, which was yeah. was more of dealing with I couldn't process the feeling of the loneliness, the the not being loved part of it. Then you got the girlfriend parts of, that comes plays into it. Then you got the it, it was so much that was going into it, and then. You had the older kid at that point in time. It, it was a senior. I'm a freshman. I'm just coming into uh, into uh, uh, the high school. And previous, before I left the high school, I I was like I said, I dealt with anger uh, management problems, which wasn't really anger management. It was I didn't know where how to place my sure my 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 grieving. I didn't know how to place my I, my thought process at the time. So I would take I, I would was to lash out. I, I would lash out in in a sense where. It was more to, to help the people who couldn't defend themselves because I felt like that was me at a point. So that's what I was doing a lot of. So when I got to to high school, it was like, all right, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. There's no fighting. There's no nothing. And this guy got in the line. He was a, a senior, and he had pushed me because I was in front of him. He had pushed me, and I jumped. And then he was like, Oh, you're you're an underclassman. You go back there, and I was like, "Well, you don't know who I am." Then, uh, obviously, uh, so why would you push me? And then he was like, "Oh no, you're just a you're a little guy. Don't worry about it." And I was like, "Bro, listen, don't do that. <laughs> I'm not the I'm not the I'm not gonna let you walk all over me or anybody at that point walk sure. all over me because then yep. I find, like I said, I used to like to help the people who couldn't defend themselves, and I'm not one of those people. I was very uh, physically built. At the time, so yeah, yeah. I, I did. I did uh, shove the the plate into his face, <laughs> the tray into his face after a couple of words were changed and everything. And I tried to avoid and walk so, away. <laughs> what happened then after after that? Was there a- the the people that the, the security guards came down and they knew oh, they were, that they were close that that it wasn't um me that started it. It was actually him. So they they actually reprimanded him and 
let me let mm. me uh, go because I didn't do it out of out of uh, ing. I did it because it, he was really trying to threaten me at the time, and I was like, okay, I gotta stand up yeah. for myself. And, and, <laughs> if I don't, then you know, as I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was saying, I like, I felt like I had to stand up for myself. It was my freshman year in high school. If I don't stand up for myself now, then it just leaves the door open for not do I'm already going through things. It leaves another door open for you to think that or other people to think because we're in a cafeteria full of we went to a big high school, so it's full of hundreds and hundreds of kids. It just leaves the door open mm-hmm. for them to think that they can, you know, take advantage of me during these years, uh, these four years I'm here. Yeah. So you guys both, and it's again, not surprising because almost hundred percent of the time people in this area of helping advocate through mental health has had a life experience or two or five or a hundred <laughs> that led, that led them to being passionate about this. So I don't think you guys are atypical to almost every other person out there. If we were put them on this show and I had them talk about their past, I'd say almost a hundred percent of the time there's something traumatic. There's something depressive. There's something yeah. unfortunate that happened that again, you guys have found a vehicle through your podcast and through talking to other people and sharing your stories. I think what the three of us are saying is that it's okay. It's okay to break down those walls and it's okay for three grown men to hug each other, to cry and to laugh, sometimes laugh at ourselves. You know, I think humility is, is a virtue. It's something that we lack in our country today. And, and everything's so much about us and and me and narcissism and all this. And sometimes you just got to say, you know what, man, it sucks. It's happened to me, but I, I got to find something humorous in it or it's going to kill me, you know? Yeah. Uh-huh. And I, 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 I've learned and I'm older than you guys. So I've got a little bit more experience. That's I'll leave it at that. Um, in regards to handling things that have happened that to wisdom, me Jeff. and I, I really laugh. I like, I like to laugh all day, man. I really do. And it helps me deal with all the stuff I've been through. Yeah. I think that's why that class was so like, just, it was monumental. For oh, us. it was, it was a life. We laughed a and that, lot. And it's, as far as I'm, it helps. And as far as I'm concerned, we had that, that class, the very, that was the very first class of the day for us. So set it set up the, the whole mood for, for the rest that's of the perfect. day. Yeah. So that, that class. Did you have brothers and sisters that were going through similar things when you were growing up that um, you were aware of or weren't aware of? And if you eventually became aware of these issues, how have they how have they dealt with their their own mental health uh, challenges? Uh, I do. I have a. I do. I don't have the mental side. I have the physical side, though. My sister. Mm-hmm. Oh my okay. goodness, man! Just because I can remember, she we we both got adopted together. Okay. Right. I have a family of six and we all are like, uh, got taken away. All of us with oh, the last wow. one. And I'm the middle child. My, uh, second, the second oldest got adopted with me and my third oldest, I mean the third oldest, the oldest went, <laughs> went with her uh, father and me, me and my sister, we, we, to, to see her, how she handled everything, how she handled everything was like, She's very grown real, real quick, and mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm young, so everything that happened to her, like I remember her calling Dyfus into the household, and I'm not understanding what was going on, the processes of everything, because they came in the household. They, you were watching, you were observing. I was observing everything, and then she she used to run away a lot, um, mm-hmm. and uh, sneak off, and 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 come back in the morning. I it, the cops would be called, and cops were at her house. And I'm like, man, what is going on? I don't understand none of this. What are you doing? Like, mm-hmm. And I couldn't understand right. it until I was old enough to say, hey, I, I, I get what you were doing. I wouldn't take those routes. Like, I'm more a little bit more grounded, but I get what you were sure. doing. And I get why you thought you should do what you were doing. I get it now. Because, like I said, I, I was in this family, but I didn't feel like I fit this family or they, they had their right, own I kids already. You. So they were, you know, kind of treating their own kids like their own kids. And we were the add-ons. Yeah. And yeah, she, sure. the way she took it and the way I've seen it for years and years. Oh my goodness. I, I, her life was tough. <laughs> it was very, very, very yeah. tough. And we, we, we still talk today where it's like, 
yo, remember when we used to do this? And, hey, yo, you got to get over certain things. Like, me being a, a mental health advocate now, I, I'm able to speak to her more on a mental note and how to get her mind straight and everything. But years of damage to one person, it takes a toll. Because once you... I figured because I see her every I see her in her how she moves. Once you were moving a certain way for a certain period of time, it's hard to break that. Yeah, I'm sitting here hearing your story, and it pulls me back to my life with Seth, Ian, and Roman, and how we watch Seth do a lot of those things as well. You know, the two younger brothers. Um, we watch them watch Seth when he was making series of poor choices, yeah. whether he had control or not, it's not the point of my story, but they were 13 and 15 when Seth died. And so a lot of people that see this happen to an older brother tend to go off one end, Yeah, you know, I'm going to let my dog out real quick. So Molly can edit this part out. So that's one of the advantages of taping. And I'm by myself <laughs> and my dog's barking. So hold on a second. Into. I like this platform. It's still raining outside. I do too. That's why I said uh, we might switch over. All right. So I'm going to, um, I'll just jump in here. So, so when I was listening to your conversation, you were talking, Ramir, about your sister. It, it kind of pulled me back to when I was thinking about Seth and Ian and Roman because the boys had the advantage in hindsight now to see what happens when an older sibling makes you know, a series of poor choices, yeah. whether those were choices that Seth had control over or his addictions dictated his decisions. That's, that's a different debate. The fact is that they were 13 and 15 and when Seth died. It. Now that's, that's part of the story because a lot of kids would use that as a crutch the rest of their life. To, to, yeah. You know, I lost my brother. I lost my brother. I, 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 you know, I, it's unfair because, you know, you haven't lost your brother, but I lost mine. And I'm mad, I'm angry, and and so they become bitter. Yeah. And this is this whole thing that I'm out trying to talk to people, especially on the tour, when we'll talk about this at the end when I'm going to meet you guys finally, is this living undeterred, better, not bitter, is that, you know, a lot of kids will look at their older siblings and become bitter. But then there's a set of kids that look at their older siblings and they become better. And yeah. I think as mental health advocates, our responsibility is to find that pivot point, find Weird what that. what makes kids decide to use adversity to their advantage versus those that want to become a victim. And I'm intrigued by that. I don't really know. I, I, listen, I don't know the answer. Uh, to you know? be honest, I, I say because I, I watched her do what she did all those years, and I'm like, Man, this, I mean, it's not working out for you. Every day, every time you right. do it, it's just not seeming to work it out for you. So I'm going to do it the opposite way and see if it works for me the opposite way other than doing it your way. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people do use it as a crutch. Hey, you know, my sister, I, like, I know I, for me, it was like, I've seen everything you do and I'm going to do the opposite because it didn't work for you. It, it, it severely didn't work for you. You're still out here doing your, your the same things. So it, yeah, because you certainly don't have to let adversity define you negatively. No, and that, that you know that's. I think I told you guys my favorite quote is "Pain is unavoidable, suffering is a choice." And if you think about <laughs> that, I think there's a book called "Chosen Suffering" somebody wrote. But the fact is that suffering really is a choice. Um, you you can hang on to it. You can let it be all consuming or you could use it as fuel to the fire you know you can use it to keep fueling that fire whether it's writing marquise or whether it's a podcast you're doing or in my case it's our tour it's like constant fuel to the fire so i i like to see people that are struggling not try to get past what they're what they're struggling but actually use it, use it as inspiration or aspiration I have a you know, use it as something that yeah, you know. I have a question then. Um, and it's for both yeah, of you sure. guys. Uh, uh oh. <laughs> how do you. If it's a tough one, Marquise, you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> how do you go about using it as, as fuel versus 
using it towards the negative and using it for pity wise because a lot of people like to take that struggle and use it towards the pity part of it and uh, throw a pity party for themselves and then you know want people to feel sorry for their story versus using that story to build something into something greater in themselves go ahead Marquis. take it take it Marquis. you're hey you're on my show so you have the you have the floor so go (laughs) ahead well i'm gonna use my own example for this one uh for it you know after period of, of course you know you know but uh, <laughs> after a period of time of course uh later a little later on in life maybe like er- early to mid 20s is when uh i started to realize how bad things got 18 years old attempted suicide i should have died and i'm glad i didn't wow. but attempted again at 21 attempted again at 23 at the, wow. by the third time i realized how precious my life was and i can be doing so much more instead of wallowing in my sadness why don't i make, I'll make a bright day for someone else Right. So I always think of this one phrase and Ramir and I, we said this phrase multiple times that, you know, you can turn a coal into a diamond using the good amount of pressure, the right amount of pressure, but mm-hmm. too much pressure, it just destroys the rock. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we look at our trauma, our issues or the things we're dealing with as too much pressure. Maybe it's not, it's too much. Maybe you're not keeping yourself solid enough to deal with that pressure in order to make yourself new or elevate yourself to the next level. So a good way that I personally looked at this better as, all right, I'm dealing with this. Let me honor my trauma. Let me look at it for what it is. Let me accept it for what it is. And now instead of wallowing about it, I look at it as, oh, snap. I used to be that person. I used to feel like this. I used to be this person who dealt with it this way, that way, and this way. But now I'm not like that anymore. It's honoring it and looking back and reflecting on the beautiful things that you have accomplished, whether it be big or small, (laughs) wide or narrow. The fact is you made an adjustment. You made a change. And And those changes, now I can reflect on other people and they can do the same thing. You're You're setting up your own example and emulation all in one step. And I heard a teacher had told me this once. And he was talking to the whole class, but it really resonated with me. And I kept it to to the day. He was like, listen, I I don't need you guys to mature overnight. I don't want you to mature overnight. I don't need you to grow overnight. What I need you to do is every year grow a little bit more and more and make yourself a little better. I feel like I know exactly who said that. And I love that. You can take that same quote and apply it to what you just said. Nobody's asking you to get over your trauma right away or get over what you're going through. but and, or or to use it as fuel right now. Like, just go out there and make some positive out of this. I, I think what, what you should be doing is step by step, baby step it. If you have to make your make that trauma into something better. But step by step, baby step it if you have to. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. thinking because I had something happen yesterday that goes right in hand to what you guys are both saying about this concept of step by step is I was talking about when you lose somebody, uh-huh. like in my case, my son and, and my wife, but everyone's eventually going to lose somebody, is you tend to think about maybe their death date. You know, like October 4th is the date where Seth died or the date on his death. So I'm a part of a lot of Facebook chat rooms of parents that have lost children, and they spend a large amount of time, you know, obviously the day that the anniversary comes up, their heavenly birthday becomes a huge tribute and I understand the utility or the need for that. Yet, I think at times it's counterproductive because it takes you back to that pain you had the day you found out they died. So a friend of mine said, you know what, Jeff? Here's what I suggest people, people do. And this guy was a, a motivational speaker type person. And he said, grieve all during the year. Don't, don't grieve on one special day. And if you slice it up in the little tiny bits, it's a lot more manageable. And so I got to thinking to myself, I thought, man, that that's a great way. Like you just said, Ramir about, about spreading it out. It's like, this is now I'm changing the lens a little bit. And I'm talking about specifically grief and that sometimes this is where the holidays get hard, right? We sit around Christmas and we think about grandma that died. We think about whatever happened over the, and we miss that person. But why can't every day we celebrate the person we miss uh, every day of the year? And then, then, then we're not just blindsided by anniversaries or birthdays and 
it seems like it's just a cycle we repeat as humans and we don't learn from it. We forget they lived you know? every day. They didn't live on their birthday or live on the, the holiday. Exactly. They lived every exactly. day of their life. These people that we cherish. Right. So why not celebrate yeah. them every day and, and honor exactly. them? We can. We just don't. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You got to change can. that narrative, change that, 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 that process of thinking. And it doesn't happen right away for everybody. But some people, like, you, it's, it's just that switch you need to to turn on. Yeah. Well, I'll, you guys kind of do I'll, that with your podcast because you guys, you know, every week revisit certain topics. I'm sure both of you share your stories yeah. now fairly regularly. And it's not like once, like once a year, you guys have this huge breakdown <laughs> where all this stuff comes to head because that would be so counterproductive yeah, to what we're doing. A, what you're trying to do to help other people, but also to help yourself. And so I think, I think this idea of spreading it out over the course of years is a, a, a great idea that just needs to be talked about more as an option for people, you know? It makes the relief yeah. so much I, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, it definitely does. And I think one thing uh, I would encourage anybody to do is write your life story. Write yeah. it down. Write your complete life story. I'm currently working on my autobiography, just strictly Good for, for me. And I've been writing it since, I think, what, before the pandemic, maybe 2018. I started writing it. It's just I'm compiling all my memories, all all the thoughts, everything that added to my life, subtracted from my life, and equal to my life. So mm -hmm. by doing that, I realized this, I, I wrote literally a whole chapter dedicated to my grandparents, and mm -hmm. that chapter really goes off of the sweet memories, the the hard times, the things they went through, their life's experiences, and looking at it from the lens of that eight year old me that used to adore them. That 13 year old yeah. me that loved going down to the visit, that version of me where I learned how to be a respectable young person by watching them and understanding them and, and learning wisdom from them. So I say that's one of the best ways to reflect is to write down your life story. It is, you don't have to publish it. It could be strictly for you, but it's, it's similar to how my grandma used to uh, used to make like a family quilt. And each generation yeah. put their own patch in the quilt. So that's a way for them to remember the people before them and the great things that they've done. Each quilt has its own little characteristic by that person who who made that part of the quilt. So it's like for that journaling. Theme, like yeah. In a way, it's like journaling. But, you know, when I started writing my book, uh, and I don't remember, did I send you guys copies? No, I didn't get one. I'm not sure. <laughs> that long pause sure means I probably didn't. Um, but I also, my audio book's done. So if you guys just went to audible, you guys could listen to my book in my voice, which is probably the better way to listen because it's a lot more uh, authentic and emotional. Um, but when I wrote the book initially Marquise, it, it was really kind of a memoir about me and what we went through with my son. And at that time, my wife was still alive. But as I started going through the book, I realized fairly quickly when I started sharing stories that, you know, if no one else is going to write these things down. No. And when everyone dies, all these stories die. And so I thought to myself, if anything, I'm writing these for other people, not about my life. But so my granddaughter, Brighton, whose dad died three weeks before she was born, now can know what her dad was like, the good and the bad, but it's in a book, you know, it's immortalized. It's, it's stamped in time. And that's the advantage of doing a book is it doesn't have to be a, a big, big thing about your life, but it really encompasses the lives around you and you can put those in, in stone. And that's the beauty of a, of a memoir, you know, but a lot of them are written that way. A lot of them are just me, 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 me. And I think, I think the ones I've always been interested in is when you go off in these little storylines, like I want to hear about grandma. I want to hear about how grandma grew up. I want to hear about, you know, where she worked. I want to hear about her struggles. Cause at the end of the know? day, and, it and I think you. that to me is what I like about a memoir. And at the end of the day, yeah. it made you who you are. I mean, those, those, those people right. that are around you do make you, especially if you think about them often enough, like I wish, that, mm -hmm. I wish my grandmother would have left her, her cookbook because like you said, <laughs> when things when, when the people die, they, they they the stuff they had with them, they go to. And I've been for for years, yeah. I've been trying to re remember my grandmother's caramel cake recipe, and 
She never wrote it down. <laughs> and I can't, nobody can get it. So every time I have a piece of caramel cake, I'm like, this is not like my grandmother. We can't yeah, not this, tell it. This isn't like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny you say that because uh, my sister and my grandma, my older sister and my grandmother That's have awesome. something very in common. They have this one way of thinking where they, I said to them, hey, give me the rest of me for your potato salad. My grandma's potato salad was by far the best. <laughs> my sister, my older sister is a foodie. She came very close. Very, there's something a little off, but it's so close you can barely tell. <laughs> a little off. And I asked her, I said, hey, you almost recreated grandma's recipe. Can I have your recipe? She says, no, I'll teach your wife how to make it, but I'm not teaching you how to make it. And I said, why? Because if I teach you how to make it, then you'll stop coming to me for it. Ah. And I'm like, Mm. Grandma She's said the smart. same thing. Grandma said the yeah. exact same thing. She said, I'll teach your wife how to, but I'm not teaching you how to do it. Because then you'll forget That's about me. That's interesting. That's first question, you know? How to make that come okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so when I when I meet you guys. Caramel cake is going to be available, right? I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, a version of it. <laughs> My version of it. <laughs> Yours or Marquise or uh, somebody else? <laughs> I'm a cheesecake baker. I bake cheesecakes and stuff like that. I love cheesecake. Well, I'll have that. But, uh, hey, I am serious, though, about uh, coming out to see you guys. I know people watching this are very familiar with the Living on the Third U.S. tour. I'm not sure when this will actually uh, post, but more likely probably prior to when we see you guys. But um, I reached out to both of you to be available for our New Jersey stop. Oh, yeah. We're kind of finalizing that as we speak. Um, you guys would be advocates, what we call local advocates, yeah. and we can discuss the format. But I'm super excited to kind of take this this national spotlight with our tour, literally turn it on your area and you, specifically what you guys are doing for mental health. And then you know, broadcast that throughout the country. So like I say in my intro video, this is happening in every house, yes. in every street, in every city, in every state. And so I think, again, I think I told you guys yesterday in our call, when we were ch talking about the Midwest is that we're fairly insulated to a lot of the things that you guys and, and people on the West coast and down in Florida and, you know, we're, Florida we're a flyover, flyover country. We don't have a lot of stresses out here. Um, you know, there, there's a big meth problem here because the farmers with anhydrous ammonia and all that, the, 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 um, the products to make meth is very readily available in the Midwest out here. But, but my point is, is that mental health doesn't discriminate, doesn't care if you're a farmer, if you're a bus driver, oh, or if okay. you're a, what occupation, a, a you fishing know. guide in Florida, uh, or anything. Yeah. At, like I said, athlete, actor, movie star, whatever, um, and so that's why I'm happy that our paths cross because I know that there's a lot of collaboration we can do. And it's been, it's been a f one of the fastest hours I've ever had and one of the most <laughs> enjoyable podcasts I've ever done. And I do want to get you guys back on after the tour to get a little bit of a gauge on, on how you guys have um, progressed as mental health advocates. And, and you guys are both fairly, you know, you guys are both young. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I didn't even start in this, mental health thing till, you know, pretty much 52. So you guys have a huge head start on me on, on making a dent, which you will, I, I predict that. Um, you, but any last words you guys wanted to say to, to my listeners of encouragement and wanna, anybody that's struggling? I did want to say first, first and foremost about the tour part of it. I seen the bus. It, it looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys can fit. You guys can fit on it. So uh, hey, it gets, need, sleeps nine. It can. We we've had at one time ten people on it. So it's kind of fun. Whenever you need me, Jeff, we're there. As far as last words, uh, to wrap up a little bit of what we talked about, everything, every vehicle you use, whatever vehicle that is, whatever modality that that happens to be, find find something that works for you. Don't hold on to the problem. Find ways to to elevate yourself, and and it, know that the journey doesn't stop. It is not an end goal. There's never a it, it, this is it. It's always a, a a work in progress, and you'll always be a work in progress, no matter what, what stage of life you're on. You could be fifty two, you can be twenty eight, you could be ninety nine, and still have a lot to work on. Never stop working on yourself to become better, and. This mental health thing is 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 bigger than all of us. It's, it is all of us, at the end mm -hmm. of the day. So, 
take it serious. And, and if you need to help, we're out here. You got three of us, three of us men talking about mental health, yeah. which which is very rare nowadays. I went to a mental health event and the, the amount of women <laughs> that were there opening up is crazy. But the, the men, they, they, like a lot of people came to me and approached me and say, you know, it's not a lot of men doing this. And there's three men on this podcast right now talking yeah. and, and it, it's amazing to see. Don't, don't, don't ever get too prideful about who you are yeah. in, in this situation. Everybody's going through it. Let's work it. Let's work this out together. We'll, we'll make it more acceptable, but uh, yeah, well, well said my friend. I appreciate that. Marquise, what do you, what do you think? What's your last words of <laughs> wisdom from, from your experience? He's about to give a paragraph. I'm going to stop. <laughs> It, it is going to be fair. Right? <laughs> uh, so this is actually a quote from an autobiography. It's actually uh, something my uh, old teacher used to have, a history teacher, that he broke down history so well that I, I, I had a, a love for it. Um, and he said, a true measure of success is contingent not on how much money you have in the bank, but how much heart, virtue, and integrity one has. Not to reject money, but to value it as a means to take care of oneself and one's family. Doing so will provide a stable and safe environment for growth and prosperity. And in the process... You make a way for a person to feel content, not with what he or she has or doesn't have, but with he or she has accomplished. True success is how you feel about yourself at the end of each day. Seeing how every day brings their own challenges will push you to be successful every day. Uh, for me, that phrase was so important because we don't realize that every day that we try our best, every day that we try our hardest, and every day that we put our best foot forward, we are setting our ourselves up for success in the long run. Success mm -hmm. is what, what is measured not by how many breaths you take, but the moments to take your breath away. I know I took that from a movie, but it's so important. <laughs> I like that. I like You that. know, it, it is based off of you feeling good about yourself. So regardless of what people are going to say about you, regardless of what people think about you, remember one thing. You have to feel good about yourself in your own skin. So don't build walls. Try to build fences because at least you can see them coming and close the door on it behind when you don't like, <laughs> when you don't like the person that's coming, coming through the door. You know, I like that. Never set yourself up for failure. Set every day up, every day up for success. That way, you can be successful in the long run. Well, I certainly wish you guys the best, and I know we're gonna we're gonna keep continuing this journey together and um, try to make a difference and uh, show people. Like I said, it's okay to laugh, cry, and learn. Yeah. That's kind of the the three things we have to do every day. But listen, it's been an honor and a pleasure. And Real quick, um, Jeff. as, it's as been always, an hour. I tell every guest. Yeah, it's been a fast hour, man. <laughs> I feel like we even we even scratched the surface still. We're not even getting started. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll get you guys back on. I'll come back on your show, and that's four hours we can talk right there. I so. feel like we got to go. And then plus seeing you guys out in, when I come out uh, in New Jersey. So, um, But listen, you guys keep living undeterred. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're helping lots of people, and um, we're, just, we're just getting started, okay? Yeah, man. We got a long way to go. All right, we man. Keep going.